the mighty and rapid Dniester carves its way through the Dniester Canyon National Park along the length of 250 kilometers. Steep slopes overhang the river instead of medieval architecture. The canyon is a wonderful and unique natural region. It is an inexhaustible source of discovery. Different geological periods are reflected on the walls of the canyon rocks. These rocks preserved the traces of prehistoric life, starting from the Devonian period, 400 to 480 million years ago. Distinctive climatic conditions are created here. Under the sun's rays, canyon walls get heated much more than the flat valley. They push the heat fluxes up, which then disperse the thunderstorm masses. Thunderstorms pass by to the left or to the right. Thunderstorms are extremely rare along the Dniester. The special climate of the canyon allows many plants to remain green until late autumn. The trees here do not shed their leaves for a long time, and their lush fruits support birds, which stay in this natural reserve park to pass the winter in the harsh times. This year the harvest of hawthorn is not very good, although I can see quite a few fruits on this tree. Hawthorn is a good remedy for the cardiovascular system. You can buy it in a pharmacy or you can collect it on the slopes of the Dniester Canyon. Hawthorn helps the wintering birds not suffer from starvation. For thrushes and bullfinches a hawthorn bush is a godsend. These mighty canyon steeps are full of even more surprises. In the off-season you can see the so-called Tears of the Canyon. Small waterfalls, sometimes they are multi-stage, cascade down to the Dniester, replenishing its course with clean water. Here's one interesting phenomenon of the Dniester slope. The underground groundwater flows out basically from the tops of the slopes. Earlier, when the water plane was much higher, there were many springs. They cascade down in streams like multi-stage waterfalls. This wonder is very picturesque. There are hundreds of such miniature waterfalls on the banks of the Dniester. There is an unbelievable amount of such streams along the canyon. The water in them is pure, clean and crystal clear. You can drink it without additional purification. Water from the spring was pumped through a pipeline to the village on the opposite bank. Ivana Zolote is a picturesque island locked in the mindering arms of the Dniester. And interestingly, the underground waters which are washing away the limestone rocks in the interior of the earth are saturated with carbonates. Running down the slope, the stream fills this limestone in the form of travertine deposits. Over time, they reach very large proportions. Dozens of places with such travertine rocks can be found on the territory of the Dniester Canyon. Some occupy very picturesque areas of more than 100 square meters. They stream beautiful waterfalls and cavities in the form of grottoes and caves often appear inside them. It's hard to believe that such sculptural forms can originate from common polyethylene film. Here is a piece of such a stone that was apparently washed away by a stream. Pay attention, this part of the polyethylene film has already become the core of the stone. It petrified together with the moss. But in our region such a film only appeared about 30 years ago. This indicates that such stones are molding quite rapidly. 
Dniester is the second longest river in Ukraine. It carries its waters along densely populated banks, clean and rich in fish. The Dniester has attracted locals and visitors since time immemorial. We're currently in the middle reaches of the Dniester. Here the river is not navigable. But there were times when small ships sailed upstream to Holich. In these places it is similar in nature to a mountain river. Fast flow, insignificant depth and good oxygen saturation provides a suitable habitat for berbers, black sea roach, vimba and sterlet. Nine species of local fish are listed in the Red Book of Extinction of Ukraine. This is almost the only place in Ukraine where you can try your luck and maybe catch the kingfish, a sterlet, all the while slowly rafting along the river on a boat or a catamaran, admiring the amazingly beautiful surroundings. Only angling is permitted here, as there is no industrial fishing in this part of the Dniester. To increase the population of rare species of fish in the Dniester, from time to time their offspring are planted. They are especially grown at the Dniester Reservoir site for further breeding. Here the local people try to return the sterlet to the Dniester and restore the former glory of the fish river. The days when sturgeons, pikes and burbots splashed here in abundance and people were sanding them instead of angling. These surrounding banks in the form of spectacular quaint rocks with caves and grottoes still preserve the memory of those times. The deep, swift waters of the Dniester link us with the echoes of blustery antiquity. The history of Skala upon this bridge is that of 500 years of a military heroic past. Skala was the last outpost on the way down to Kamyanets, the capital of western Podilia. From the 13th to 18th centuries, fortresses in this area were built in a way that allowed for reaching the next one in daylight hours. Castles were situated 40 to 50 kilometers apart and actually represented a border between the Western Christian and Eastern Muslim civilizations. Currently, we're in the oldest part of the fortress. It was built in the 13th century. Back then it was a wooden fortification of an ancient Ruthenian settlement. At that time, Skala upon this bridge, like the Kamenets and Chervonohrad castles, was considered one of the most effective fortifications of Padilia. Even the location of the fortress on a high steepy rock served as a natural defense. On the one side this bridge, on the other a sheer drop. The only vulnerable place of the fortress was on the south side. To protect it, the castle's defenders dug a deep ditch and placed a bridge over it using huge chains. The structure was then raised or lowered whenever necessary. In front of the castle there was an inn, where a traveler could change horses. A hotel was built for the Polish gentry, with cellars for the storage of food and wine. At any moment a nobleman could stop here, spend the night and continue his journey to Kamenets in the morning. Each fortress has its own story. That of Skala Podilska is a tragic one. No castle in the Ternopil Oblast and the western Padilla region was captured as often as the castle fortress upon this bridge. And every time it had to rise from the ashes. With their last bit of strength and resources, local peasants and Polish gentry rebuilt it again and again. In these 17th and 18th centuries, magnates from the Latskoronsky family dominated here. After yet another siege of the fortress, they went to the Polish king and persuaded him to exempt the local lower middle class from paying state taxes. Instead, use this money to rebuild the ruined castle. And still, this outpost could not be made impregnable. It would seem that the walls were powerful and the steeps high, but this did not stop the invaders. 
The castle was hit especially hard during the National Liberation War led by Bohna Khmelnytsky in 1648. Capturing the castle almost without a fight, his companion Maxim Krivonis did not spare the legendary walls. The rebels destroyed this Kala castle without remorse. Then the castle was restored and brought to operating condition. But in 20 years it was besieged and occupied by the Ottoman Empire for a long 27 years until 1699. When these lands were returned to the Commonwealth, the border was moved far to the south. Turkey then fell into decay and could not hold its positions along the Dniester. The castles lost their defensive value and only this brute retained the status of the border. In 1772, after the first partition of Poland, the Ukrainian province ended up in the Austrian Empire. After that, this brute basically became a border and divided the country for 150 years. Since 1920, it was the territory of Poland and there was the Soviet Union. In the 18th century, Skala got a new owner and a new life began. The last owner of the castle to reside in it was Adam Tarlo. He decided to build a luxurious residence on the territory of the castle. A two-story palace in Baroque style cost the residents of the surrounding villages 40,000 zlotys. But the fate of the Skala Palace was tragic. An accident happened 10 to 15 years after its construction. It was struck by lightning. A terrible fire broke out and the magnificent palace turned into ruins. The castle fell into despair since then, though today its half-ruined walls and three-tiered deep cellars still preserve the secret of the Skala castle. Some ten years ago no one even suspected that there were deep cellars here. These corridors were covered with soil almost up to the ceiling. When the castle was included in the National Reserve castles of Ternopil region, these unique labyrinths were cleared. Now we have access to corridors with high arches and banquet rooms of the time. One of the castle legends tells about a subterranean passage dug from Skala to the Kamienets castle. It's about 40 kilometers in a straight line. Given the building capabilities of the time, it is clear that the existence of such a long labyrinth is most likely a fiction, although it is not a groundless one. The next Skala owners were from the Goldohovsky noble family. They did not restore the palace and the castle, building their residence on the southern outskirts of the town. Street stands, hole in the walls, wine cellars and rows of shopping stands along the streets. This is how Skala looked in the middle of the 19th century. The trade was dominated by the Jews. They numbered a quarter of the border town's population. Jews were innovators in their work. They realized that one should not neglect advertising. At first, they just put the goods in the windows, but later they turned to specialists, in particular, booking advertisers from Lviv. All these streets were crowded with the wagons arriving here. They waited in line for their turn and having passed through the customs office, which stood directly upon this bridge, they continued their journey to the Russian Empire. All oh, the things they transported. Teas from Brazil and India, thin silks from China, sweets and jewelry from the East. In fact, it was one of the major trade routes from Western Europe to the Russian Empire. This route along western Podilia was accompanied by a string of castle fortifications. The fortress of the Holy Trinity was built in 1692. By that time, western Podilia had been under the Ottoman Porte for 20 years. Poles thought how to get their land back every day and night. The only way out was to organize the blockade of Kamenets, not allowing the Turks to deliver supplies and weapons. And 19 kilometers from Kamenets, where this bridge flows into the Dniester, fortifications were erected basically in a few weeks. The forces of the whole army of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth were used for the construction. They also applied the latest technologies. The fortifications consisted of two lines of bastion earthen ramparts that crossed the peninsula from the Dniester to this bridge. Two-story sandstone and limestone towers were built on the ramparts. These were the western and eastern gates, which were 480 meters from each other. 
The gates were named after the directions that led to them. While the western Lviv gates were practically square, the eastern Kamenets gates were more elongated. The first story of each tower had arched thoroughfares, the second – loopholes. Even in winter, about 4,000 infantrymen worked on the fortification of the castle structures. Day and night, Poles attacked Turkish carts carrying food and weapons. In 1698, the fortress of the Holy Trinity was reinforced by the Cossacks and the Germans, and a hospital for 1,500 people was built. The march on Kamenets was planned quite seriously. Not for a day, not for two, but for years, the Poles did everything to prevent the Turks from feeling in command of Kamenets. This lasted right up until 1690s, but it was not the blockade that played the decisive role in the return of Kamenets. Constant wars weakened the Turkish army, and in 1699 the Treaty of Karlovitz was signed. For half a year, the Turks were stringing along the return of frightful lands to Poland. Only in March 1700, all who had left Kamenets moved out of the Trinity fortress and marched the entire 19 kilometers on foot with a large cartage. It was a long-awaited journey to the capital of Podilia, the triumph of Poland, which liberated the lands of western Ukraine from the Turkish yoke and recovered the royal city. As for us, we'll have to cover many more hundreds of kilometers to get to know and explore Ukraine better. Travel together with us, we will help you discover our beautiful land, Ukraine.